Good morning. Welcome to our anniversary Sabbath celebration. I know that you guys are catching up from that song. It has been a long journey when 10 years ago, around the dining room table of our home, two ex-military men and their families decided to plant a church in the Germantown area. And there were two families joined by two very special sons whom we love and cherish. The special needs did not diminish their love for God, their joy for the Sabbath. And I know that, you know, Devin is watching from home right now because I did actually text his mother, and I know that they're watching. Devin and Gordo actually developed this amazing relationship. And the name, the movement, was not just us coming up with a name. We have many names. But every time the movement came up, it was Devin that started flapping his hands as a demonstration of, like, that one is it. And we skipped it. Second time around, we down to two. The movement started flapping his hands once again. And to this day, we are the movement. And that demonstration humbled us. So 10 years ago, for the love we have for Devin and Mario, little Mario Gordo, our, our, our founding members, they are the founding members, not us. We wanted to be a church that preached the truth without apology using an old raggedy screen. Yeah, and I had hair back then. We were in the church in the tundra, God's country. But since our inception, we always wanted a place where broken people could come and encounter, have an encounter with Christ. I was talking to one of our members yesterday, and, you know, he was expressing, you know, no, Mario, but I did this, I did that. And I said, you know, regardless of what you do, I hope that you understand that regardless of what you do, this church is here to love you. I'm going to love you no matter what. I'm going to be here to love you. We wanted a place where a glimpse of the Savior would allow people to have the, the church every Sabbath, you know, that, that, that people will leave the church every Sabbath feeling different than what they, when, when, they, when they came in. A praise of worship that brought healing. Since that day, this little movement has been attacked by the enemy. The attacks came from everywhere, including from within. The devil has used everything in his toolbox to discourage us, to, to have us give up, to shut us down. There were moments in this journey where my wife and I wonder if we were truly supposed to be here at all. If the love we have, the desire of, you know, for souls that God put in our hearts, was it really worth all this? There have been tears, there have been pain, and during those difficult moments, those moments where we felt like giving up, we were faced with a decision. My wife and I had to decide if we were going to stand, and we prayed with intention. And in those moments of pain, those moments of discouragement, those moments of, yes, doubt, we decided to put our trust in Jesus and ask for his Holy Spirit. And we asked for it to let it rain so we could stand. 
Because the movement is here to be a place of worship that brings healing. And to prepare us for what is coming, you know, in the future, we have been digging into the subject of the Holy Spirit, entitled Led by the Spirit. And we have emphasized in particular, you know, everything that you find in the book of Acts. Just to give you a little bit of a review of, well, of, review of what we have been discussing, we've been discussing that the gift of the Holy Spirit is the result of a promise of Jesus to the church. He promised the Holy Spirit. Number two, where the Holy Spirit is, there is action. Did I hear you say amen? The Holy Spirit is not connected with deadness. The Holy Spirit is not connected with apathy. The Holy Spirit moves people to action. But we already found out from the Bible that the Holy Spirit first contact with us, and we are going to take a look at this a little bit more today. It, it, the first contact with us is, is to lead us to Christ. You cannot come to Christ. You cannot present yourself to Jesus without the aid of the Holy Spirit. It is not something that you do on your own. We read in the Desire of Ages in page 172, right at the bottom of the page it says that, that, that it is a patient and protracted process. It is the Spirit wooing us towards Christ. We also learn that the power given to us to start our own Christian walk is not sufficient to take us to the finish of our Christian walk. That's why the Bible talks about the latter rain. What kind of rain? Yeah, it, it, it is more power added to the power that you already received. We also learned that that, that special power we need to receive uh, you know, uh, to see us through the last days must be preceded by some cleansing. You cannot receive the final filling until all the junk is cleaned out of your life. And we're going to take a look at that too this morning through a life of one person. We also learn that the Holy Spirit is the empowering agent to aid believers to stand for truth as it is in Jesus Christ. And this one is the key to the sermon today, that, that one. As we talk about this, as we celebrate our anniversary, we also learn finally that the Holy Spirit is a person that needs to be honored and recognized in our daily lives. We should thank the Holy Spirit in the same way that we thank Jesus. But we said last Sabbath that some of us are struggling with this. Because we tend to think of the Holy Spirit of some a, ephemeral essence, of some vapor. Some, but, but he's a person. I said he's a person. Go ahead and say it. He's a person. And because of that, we should thank him and honor him and recognize him. Now, the book of Acts unfolds the birth, history, and development of the Christian church. That's why when the book is so valuable, because it tells us how the church got started. And one of the issues that I have and I have to deal with when I get to study in the Bible is that I can preach 10 sermons out of Acts chapter 1. Because the Bible is so full of messages in every single verse. So one of the issues that I have is not, uh, you know, Mario, don't get stuck on that one. Keep going. Keep moving. And the issue is that you start reading a verse, and I ask myself, why? Why did the Holy Spirit give those words to Luke? And I said, well, you know what? Since he gave it, you know, he gave those words to Luke, then I just got to preach about it. 
That's the reason today I'm going to stay in the book of Acts and deal with the tarrying and the waiting because the tarrying needs a real look. Because a lot of strange stuff has resulted in the Christian church from people tarrying or waiting for the Holy Spirit. Some of the stuff is attractive. Some of them is quite strange. So I'm going to come back and talk about that tarrying, that waiting. So this morning, as I was reading the Bible, I went through Acts chapter 2 in our scripture reading. And it hit me. Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. And this verse talks about my brother Peter. All right? Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Go there. Come on. Take him out. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. And Brother Luis did a good job reading this verse. I'm going to watch you now as you react with me. All right? So here this morning, I was there reading my Bible, going through my sermon, and Brutus is listening to me. Actually, no, he was snoring. And this is what I read. But Peter... Standing up with the eleven, stop. I could not get, go beyond that point. Many of us, you do not realize how much joy that phrase brings to my life. Because it says, Peter, standing up with the eleven. Now, in the Bible, standing up is very, very special. If you remember our study in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12, things come to a close when Michael does what? Stands up. You see, there are no loose words in Scripture. And I wonder why the Holy Spirit used that phrase. Because if you notice, it says Peter and the other 11. So what the Holy Spirit wanted to let you know and let me know is that all 12 stood up, which led me to our anniversary sermon title, which is, Are You Standing? Are you standing? Let's pray. Lord, help us. In Jesus' name, amen. When you read the book of Acts, we are mesmerized at everything that takes place in the book. But when you read the book, you'll quickly find how important their standing up is. Because these are the 12 that lay down. And so, in a public situation, 12 cowards. Someone ought to be praising God right now. That's why you, you need to stop reading the Bible as if it is a race. Because if you, if you have read your Bible, these 12 cowards, 12 men who did not actually have the backbone to stand beside their Savior, they are now in front of everybody in town, and the Bible says they all stood up. How can you stay just calm? By, you know, just calm. Say amen. amen. They stood up. And that got to me. Because maybe, may, maybe the function of the Holy Spirit in Mario Torres, in my life, is to finally bring me to the point where I stand up. And I want to, I want to focus on that as we celebrate one more year of existence in this church. And I'm going to do it by focusing on the one that is named Peter. Now, I'm going to get technical because the, the, the way that words are written in the Bible is very important. Because what, what is good is that, that standing is in the present progressive sense in the Greek language. Because it doesn't just mean that moment. It means that once... Peter got up. Hallelujah. He stayed up. 
Now I'm talking, uh, I'm talking individually. You have to come to the place in your life that once you get up, you stay up. Because too many of us are getting up and sitting down. Getting up and sitting down. There's no time to be falling down. You got to get up and stay up. So Peter standing, you see him? He got in the process of standing. And when he did, he could not sit down any longer. You see, in your life, in these last days, God needs a church standing. Some of us fell down this week. Go ahead and confess. You know we did. We fell down. We were flat on our face. And we don't have time to be, to be you know, to keep getting up. So today, we're going to find out why I always say that if there is a character that I relate to in the Bible, it's Peter. Because Peter is so much like us. He is the most human of all the disciples. The brother was something else. And let me tell you, when I study Peter, if you study Peter, you will believe in God. Because only a God could save a Peter. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Now, if you're honest with yourself, you can look in the mirror and say the same thing. Go ahead and be honest with yourself and get real. Only a God can save a Mario. Now let's say that together and put, put your name, you know, when I put mine, right? Only a God can save a Mario. Say it. Only a God can save a Mario. Now you're preaching. Because you're confessing. We are all confessing, realizing that our salvation is a miracle. The issue is that some of us think that God brought us to the church because of our talents, because of our stature. When, we are, when are we going to realize that God does not need you? Because to save somebody like me, it is a miracle. I don't know, but, 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 but I know that I should have died in my sins a long time ago. What are the wages of sin? What are the wages of sin? And what have you done? Sin. And so you should be what? Dead. You should be dead. You shouldn't be sitting here and listening to me, your life, your existence. The fact that God still keeps the breath of life moving through your lungs is a miracle of the grace of Jesus Christ. Go to the Gospel of Matthew. Let's talk about this Peter, friend of mine. Matthew. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to move on because the, the, the food you brought is making my stomach grow. You do know that that thing actually seeps through there. You don't get it. I smell it all here. <sighs> Matthew 4. Here we go. Matthew 4, verse 14. Go there. Yes. Matthew 4, verse 18. Excuse me. Matthew 4, verse 18. He says this. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Look at verse 19. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. What does he say to them? Follow me. Follow me. And if you remember, that's how you got started. At some point in your life, Jesus walked by your boat and said, hey, drop your nets. Change your, I'm going to change your agenda. Rearrange your direction and do what? Follow me. You know, it is the most challenging thing that you have ever done in your life to follow Jesus. Because his footsteps are big and long. And he takes you through pathways and valleys you're not prepared to walk through. You remember the famous picture of the footsteps in the sand? 
There are many times along the journey that Jesus is carrying you. Isn't that true? So, that, so that's how Peter started. Hey, follow me. Mark has the same scene in, in, in Mark 1 and verse 16. Peter is called. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, uh, has the same scene in Luke um, 5 and verse 4. Peter is called. But then John gives us another insight. Go to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John. Yeah, chapter 1. Listen to how, listen to how John, John puts it. See, sometimes we don't put two and two together. Go to John 1, verse 35. I'm just trying to give you a little background on this Peter who is standing in, you know, in the book of Acts. John 1, verse 35. Listen to what he says. He says this. All right, you're reading. Ready? Again, the next day, John stood with how many disciples? Two. All right, this is John the Baptist's disciples. Get it? All right, verse 36. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Verse 38. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? And then in verse 39 he says, he said to them, come and see. First, follow me. Then what? Come and see. See that? Follow me and come and see. Friends, those two phrases describe the Christian life. Follow Jesus, then come and see what he has for you. Now, they were shocked because Jesus didn't have any house. And yet, some of the people that preach the gospel today have houses and cars. But the one that they claim to represent had no house. I'm going to leave it there. Come and see what I am offering you. Not an apartment. Not a single family home. There's no two-car garage. Nothing on earth. Do I offer? Come and see. And some of us along the journey have been disappointed in what God has shown us, but, 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 but we forget, we forget that he said a long time ago, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. How could they be? God sees the end from the beginning. How could God why don't we stop praying those dumb prayers? How could God think like you think? God is not answering some of the stuff that you're praying for. Come and see. Now, there were already the followers of John the Baptist. Did you notice that? And that indicates that when God calls us, all of us have some form of spirituality. But God called you to take you, to, a, to, to, to take you a little bit higher. You see, you're not as high yet as God wants you to go. Now, most of the time in the Bible, he is called Simon, not Peter. Simon. Simon is the deri uh, derivation of, in the Old Testament, of the word Simeon. Simeon means an answer to prayer. In answer to prayer. Follow me. Stay awake. If you remember, Simeon was the second son of Jacob and Leah. And in the Old Testament, you see this competition between Rachel and Leah. You have a baby, I have a baby. You have a baby, I'm going to have a baby too. And the Lord blessed Leah to have most of the babies. And Leah was already feeling a little bit uh, insecure because she knew that Jacob loved Rachel more than uh, he loved her. So when she had her second baby, she said, I will call him Simeon. God answers my prayers. She saw that child as, as, as lifting, her, lifting her status in Jacob's eyes. Now the name Peter in the New Testament word, it does not appear in the New, in the Old Testament, excuse me, at all. And strange as it may seem, 
Because there's a lot of names in the Bible that appear over the life of more than one character. There, you see, there is more than one Jacob. There is more than one Joseph. There are many other examples in the Bible, but there's only one Peter. Only one person in the entire Bible named Peter. You know, the Greek word for Peter is Petros, meaning rock. Rock. Now, Peter and Jesus had a conversation in Matthew 16. Jesus asked Peter, but who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Christ says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, you are Peter, Petros, but upon this rock, Petra, Petra, Peter was Petros, but upon this Petra, Petra means a large mass of rock, a large cliff. You are a rock, but on this large, massive rock, I'm going to build my church. So Jesus separated himself from Peter. Because Jesus goes on to say, hey, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. But we saw those gates of hell prevailing against uh, uh, Peter when he denied the Lord. So Peter's name literally means a rolling rock that needs some prayer. Oh, you didn't put it together. Come on. I thought that was pretty good. Jesus means a rolling, no, Peter means a rolling rock that needs some prayer. I just described Mario Torres and you. We're not anything anybody can build something on. There's no way someone will like to build a church on me. You see, all I'm trying to do is, is make it to heaven. You see, you don't want to build anything on me. And I constantly need prayer. Now, one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible is found in John chapter 13, towards the end of the chapter. When Jesus says to Peter, in front of everybody, you are going to betray me. And Peter gets upset. No, 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 not me. I will never betray you. And the Lord says, okay, <laughs> I I'm just going to pray for you, brother. And when you are converted, go minister to the saints. Now, let's recap what we have said about Peter so far. We have a cold person whom God is leading, but he is a rolling, unstable stone who needs a lot of prayer. Does that sound familiar to anybody here? Because I just described, even if you want to say amen or not, I just describe every single one of you. But one day, we're going to stand up. I said, one day, we're going to stand up. Amen. Now we're talking about Peter standing up. But if you think about it, the human race is, a falling, is, is in a falling state. Now, in the Bible, just like standing is connected with victory, falling is connected with sin. And we know this because when Jesus was talking about Lucifer in Luke um, 10, 18, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So sin is a fall, but Christianity is a stand. You're, you're asleep now. See, sometimes the simplest truth goes go right by us. Your entire life, all that Jesus had been trying to do is stand up and, and be, be a man, be a woman. Just stand up. Stop being a wimp on planet earth. Stand up and stay up. Stop falling. Now, the story of Peter is the story of Jesus cons constantly reaching to pick him up. Pick him up. Have you been picked up by Jesus? I said, have you been picked up by Jesus? 
Have you ever been picked up by the Savior of your face, flat on your belly, embarrassed, afraid to come to church, and the Holy Spirit says, get up and go to church. Get up and face those people. They're not your Savior. I am the church. It's not their church. It is my church. Salvation comes from the cross, not from their opinions. Get up, Jesus says. I know what it's like to go to church, Peter, and wonder what people are going to say. I know how that feels. Everyone's staring at you. I've been there. Don't, let, don't, don't tell me you cannot do it. When God's spirit gets inside of you, you, you have to stand up. Now, just to give you a glimpse of the next few sermons where we're going to be talking about your personality, your marriage, your children, your choice of mate. Oh yeah, it's going to get interesting up in here, the next few sermons. You know, scholars in the Bible, in Bible characters and personalities, say that Peter was a sanguine of choleric. You know, and I was taught about this in my master's program. I was taught by really good teachers. And as a choleric, that means that he spoke often without thought. And we know that by just reading the Bible about Peter. The sanguine part is because Peter, listen, because I'm, just, I'm talking about us. As a sanguine, Peter often underestimated the seriousness of his spiritual, his spiritual condition. Because as a sanguine, a, a, a sanguine do not like to think negatively. Everything is just fine. No, it's not. You're falling apart. You are in sin. Your life is not fine. And when Jesus said to Peter, you're going to betray me. Oh, no, 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 not me. All the sanguine in him. No, no, no. I will never do anything like that, Lord. Jesus must have thought, can you believe what is coming out of the mouth of this brother? Not only are you going to deny me, but you're going to do it before the night, before, you're going to do it before tonight. I will die before I betray you, Lord. Choleric. I'll die first. Well, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you're going to do it three times. You're going to be flat on your face. And if there was a little melancholic in him, because, you know, melancholics tend to rely on themselves too much. Melancholics have a hard time learning to trust God. Because we, we, we think that we can do anything. I know that because I am one. Do your stuff and invite Jesus to watch. I got a Lord. Just, just go ahead and stand by and just cheer me on. In the meantime, Jesus is looking at me and said, you're a fool. And if there was any phlegmatic in him, then we will see that manifested because Peter was sometimes unwilling to be self-critical. You see, phlegmatics don't like to be criticized at all. There are always some reason for phlegmatics sins not to be as bad as other people's sins. Because phlegmatics always mean well. I just shot you and you're dead, but I didn't mean to do it. <laughs> you see? It, it, you know, phlegmatics will wail and cry, I didn't mean to do it, but you're dead. I hope you're listening. Because what I'm trying to say is that there is some of Peter in all of us. In our incredible Savior. Our amazing and majestic Savior. Oh, we should be glad about our Savior. Because if you have noticed in the New Testament, there are more conversations between Peter and Jesus than between Jesus and any other disciple. And I think, again, personal thought, 
I think it is because Jesus knew that Peter was closer to being like the whole human race than anybody else. So there's all kinds of interactions between Jesus and Peter where Peter is always getting egg on his face. He was impulsive. You remember Peter walking on water? Lord, if it is you, command me to come. Loud mouth. The choleric kicked in. Now, the, la the, the last thing in the world that Peter had in mind was that Peter was for Jesus to say, come. Peter, with his big mouth, he was just talking. Lord, if it is you, command me to come. Jesus said, okay, come. And now, it was just, I, I, I picture it like a movie. Lies on him. Drum roll. And I can just hear Matthew saying, hey, Peter, he said, come. You said, if you command me, well, he just commanded you. Get out of the boat. Folks, you need to imagine the scene when you're reading the Bible. Peter, you have been commanded. Get out. Can you see him? Tiptoeing. Huh? He's saying to himself, I should, I, should just, I, I should have kept my mouth shut. But now Peter is on the spot. And some of us, we talk. We talk. I'm going to serve you, Lord, for the rest of my life. And on Saturday night, you're in the club. Because you didn't expect your friend to call you. I'm going to keep the Sabbath until it is a matter of paying the bills. I'm sorry, Lord. I will not do it again until you are all by yourself doing what you should not be doing. Now, Peter walks out on that water. And you got to give him credit for that. Because the pressure is on and the whole church is looking at him. And it is amazing, an amazing moment of faith because he has to believe that the water that he is standing in, he's going to stand on. You see, there's water in the boat up to his ankles. Peter, walk on it. Well, I'm not, I, I'm not walking on it right now, Lord. Peter, you said, command me, get out of the boat and come. Folks, as we celebrate our 10th year anniversary, I need you to listen to me very carefully. There is a Peter moment coming to your life soon. Where God is going to actually get tired of you hanging back with the crowd and he's going to find out where you are by yourself. You're going to have to walk on water by yourself in the midst of a storm with the winds blowing all around you. But the key is to keep your eyes on your Savior. But the minute the melancholic in Peter came out where he thought that he was walking by himself, when that happened and he took his eyes off Jesus, Look at me, said, you, you know, look at me, said Peter, you know, boasting in front of the disciples. You know how we are, right? The minute he started boasting, he started sinking. I'm talking about us this morning. Down he goes. But the God we serve is a God who specializes not in your embarrassment, but in your salvation. Lord, save me. And that smart disciple in a mess. You see, you can say anything about Peter, but he was smart. Think about it. He decided, you know what? This is not the time for a pastoral prayer. You're sinking in 55 billion you know, gallons of water. There's no time for great God in heaven who created the planets and the stars and Mars and Venus. You know how we are. You're sinking, Peter. Well, let me get to the point, Lord. Lord, save me. And got answers. But he was impulsive. And so are you.
Nobody said amen. Some of you joined the church on an emotional whim. You had no idea what you were getting into. You didn't know what it would be to lose your job over the Sabbath. You didn't know that. You had no idea how many friends will depart from you when you decided that you will not play those games anymore. You jumped out of the boat, but you did not know really how to walk on water. Because the key is not walking on water, the key is staying on top. He was impulsive, but Jesus loved them. Come on, say amen. Impulsive, but Jesus loved them. He could also be affectionate. In Matthew 26, it says that Peter, Peter wept. At the moments of, of his conversion, Peter broke down and wept. I like that about Peter. Folks, there are times in your life when you have to stop pretending. Go ahead and cry like you have never cried before. And don't worry about whether or not your snot is coming out of your nose. Cry. Why? Because you know you need help. See, there's no time to look pretty or try to be pretty. You messed up. You're falling apart. You don't care what the church thinks. Crawl down in the aisle and give yourself to Jesus Christ. Peter cried. And I believe it was a wrenching cry. You know what I'm talking about? I believe he gets, his guts came out. Came out. I believe he sobbed and heaved like an animal because he, was, he now has faced Peter as Peter is. And he doesn't like what he sees. And so there was that moment when Peter was first impulsive and then fully submissive. He could also be presumptuous. Not just presumptuous, no, no, no. Very presumptuous. If you look at Matthew 16, Matthew 16, go there. Matthew 16, I, I need you to, let, you know, listen, look at how we treat Jesus. Matthew 16, verse 22. Uh-huh. <laughs> I got so excited this morning. The dog actually got up and said, oh, we're going to play. I was like, don't you dare start running. You're going to wake up your mother. Matthew 16. Look, you see, in verse 21, Jesus just announced to the church that he has to suffer and die. And Mr. Presumptuous, Peter, who thinks that he can, he, he thinks he can advise God. Look at what he says in Matthew 16 and verse 22. Let's look at these words. Peter is talking to Jesus. And he says, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Wait, 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 wait a minute, fella. And believe me, we're not just talking about Peter here. I'm about to bring it home right now. He presumes to tell Jesus how to save him. You don't need to die for me, Lord. I'll make it without your death. Such presumptuous. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a, how dare you tell God what it takes to save you from sin? Don't take my job. Don't take my spouse. Don't take my reputation. Don't take my health. How dare you tell God what it takes to save you? He rebuked the Lord. And sometimes we dare to ask, why me? You know, sometimes people call me struggling like it happened oh, on Tuesday this, you know, this week, sick. And they always ask me, why me? And I tell them in love, how dare you question God's love for you? Peter was presumptuous. He could also be cowardly, timid. I mean, think about it. Here's the brother that in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers come, Mr. Choleric is ready. Knife out. Servant of the high priest. Peter was good with the sword. Ear gone. 
He was a fisherman. Now, in Puerto Rico, you know, we, you, you, can still, you, you can still actually go buy, you know, fish at the fishery right there, you know, in the morning and buy from the day's catch. You, have ne you never see a fisherman's knife dull. That's why he took that ear off in one slice. Jesus looks at this fool, picks up the ear. Isn't Jesus something? He picks up the ear, dirty, bloody ear, and hits Marcus upside the head. Pa! Ear back. And I believe that when I get to heaven, I'm going to see Marcus like this, walking around like this, I still can't believe. But then what happens with Peter? He runs. You see, I grew up hanging out in the ghetto. In the ghetto, I can see the ghetto boy running with the knife in hand. Because one of the things that you learn from the streets is that, that if, if what you just used did not work, you run. Peter took his blade out. Oh, that didn't work. Got to go. You see how many extremes we live in? But the most beautiful thing you can read in the Desire of Ages is that Jesus loved him when he took the sword out and Jesus loved him when he ran. Peter could also be self-sacrificing. The Bible test says that he left all. But he could also be considered self-seeking. Because after he left all, he says to Jesus, well, what are we, what are we going to get? Lord, we give up our job for the Sabbath, but when is the new job coming? Friends, I need you to listen to what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us this morning. We have a tendency to bargain with God. Some of us are still trying to do a trade deal with God. I will serve you if. But the problem is that you have nothing to trade with. Are you seeing yourself in Peter this morning? I said, are you seeing yourself in Peter this morning? He amazes me. This is the man who made the most powerful confession about Jesus that is found in the Bible. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. The rest of the disciples were there just fumbling around. Maybe, oh, maybe you're Elias. Maybe you're Jeremiah. Maybe you're John the Baptist. I can see Jesus saying, oh, man, really? And here comes Peter. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, some people miss a very important fact about the, this interaction because People don't keep reading. Five verses later, when Jesus says, I have to go to the cross, Peter says, no way. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. The same man, the same church member who comes to church every Sabbath, the same person who says, amen, amen. The same said that says, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, becomes the person who during the week loses it all. Say things that have, they have no business saying. They go to places they have no business going. If Jesus could, could, be, you know, could be driven crazy, we would do it. Because when you think about it, the most important word in Christianity is consistency. The Bible calls it faithfulness. But it's, it, it, it is our back and forth, back and forth, and Jesus hang, hangs in there until he gets us to stand up. Our extremes make us difficult to save. In Isaiah 30 and verse 21, he says that we have to come to the point where we listen to that voice behind our ears saying, this is the way, and we really walk in it. Are you with me? Isaiah 40 and verse 17 talks about hearing the word and obeying. Luke 1 verse 76 to 79 talks about the Spirit reaching out to us. 
But when you study Peter, Peter's life, you see conceit or arrogance in Matthew 26. You see his tendency towards ease. If you go back to the, to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is on his knees in the garden. And he's praying with so much passion that blood begins to pour out his pores. But remind me, what was Peter doing? Sleeping. Your salvation is on the line. It may be your last day of probation and you are spiritually asleep. I mean, thinking, thinking that you have one more day. How many of us can say that? Oh, I'm just going to do it later. One more breath. Thinking that we have one more breath. And Christ is saying, Lord, I don't think I can do this. Take this cup. And you are asleep. But because he believes in you and believes in this movement, he says to the Father, thy will be done. You see, you cannot forget that it was the Father. We give Jesus his, his due respect and he deserves it, but it is the Father who ultimately said to the Son, there's no other way. I want to save them. And the Father, God Almighty, the Almighty Judge, was as hungry for your salvation as the Savior. Don't you cut God out of that picture. The Father, the great God, whose awesomeness is beyond our, pers uh, our, 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 dis our description. The God who seems unreach unreachable. He was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. You can also see Peter's rashness. Christ is arrested. And the Bible says that Peter follows him at a distance. You see, Peter was unwilling to be identified with the Savior. You better listen to me. Because some of us do this all the time. We go to places. We say things. And because of our actions, it shows how much we are unwilling to be identified with Christ. The last date you went on. The last date you went on with a person you are supposed to win for Christ. And your conduct, you were unwilling to be identified with your Savior. You say yes when you have said no. You follow from afar. And of course, following God from afar off leads to the next natural step. When you follow God from afar, leads you to deny him. With curses. Folks, you cannot miss the next few sermons, even though they're going to be hard, but it's going to be the Holy Spirit speaking to every single one of us here. But today I'm talking about being real. I'm trying to get you balanced instead of swinging back and forth because God needs somebody to stand up. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Peter goes from following him from afar to completely denying him. I never knew him. And the rooster crowed for the third time and Peter became a mountain of embarrassment. But we are told, Glory to God. We are told, thank you, Jesus, that at some point, the eyes of Peter locked in with the eyes of Jesus. And Peter saw in the eyes of Jesus love, compassion, and forgiveness. I know you're better than that, Peter. I know that you are. I need you to read the following statement that I found in the devotional, You Shall Receive Power. January 15th date. I need everyone here and at home to read this with me, please. When the Spirit of God, come on, read, takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life 
sinful thoughts are put away, evil deeds are renounced, love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness, and the countenance reflects the light of heaven. I can see the disciples praying in the upper room, just like we did nine years ago. They're embarrassed. One of them had hung himself. All of them ran. They can barely look at each other in the eye. Not one of them can stand up. And they spent a good time looking at themselves. Because you see, you'll never stand until you take a hard look at yourself. Stop saying it's not so bad. Stop saying it's not so serious. Stop saying you're going to get through it. You will never get through it until you take a hard look at yourself and then declare before God, I am not worthy to be saved. I am trash. I don't deserve to be called by your name. And for the next several days, they pray and wrestle. They pray and struggle. They be, they, until they became pure and clean. The garbage was thrown out of their door. The lies were cleaned up. The spirit saw all these vacant spaces and heaven cannot stand a vacuum. And the spirit moved into that room and took possession of those disciples. And suddenly, there was this wind blowing. People heard it. The disciples began to talk. People heard it. And the Bible says they all came running. What is this? And then the Bible, with the simplicity in which it was written, says, and Peter standing up with the eleven. Well, here's what blows my mind. You see, we are told in that group who heard Peter and the, and the eleven, there were people who had been at the trial of Jesus. In that group were people who had been around the same fire where Peter cursed and swore, I don't know him. In that group were people who remember that the disciples disappear because there were guards who, who, were, who were converted that day and they remember when the disciples ran. And now because God's spirit has taken possession of his church, they all stand up. And 3,000, including, including, you know, not including men and children, 3,000 who has saw them fall down. But you have to stand up when you fall down. You have to stand up where you fall down to. And folks, the issue is not falling. The issue is standing up after you fall. Some people choose to stay down. But not Peter. See when the devil attacked us. In the beginning of the movement. Like I said in the beginning. The net and I and the other faithful. Could have made the decision to stay down. But we realize. Is that. We're going through an upper room experience. We were being worked on and molded. We realized that we were all Peters. We all have good days and bad days like Ninette and I had this, you know, this week, like Reggie had, like all of the leadership team had. And, it's, and it still gets to me that this character that I love so much in the Bible, that, that, that one that said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, had, you know, had to say, that Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. 
that character is describing your life. Up and down, good and bad. But thank God that Jesus does not give up on us individually and as a church. So when we were attacked, Gamaliel came to mind. Don't worry about it. They will all break it up. It's not going to last. But if it is of God, no one can take it apart. So my brother Peter, impulsive, then submissive. On a high, then on a low. Whining, then praising. Winning, then losing. Cursing, but then praying. And a lot of times, we all have Peter Weeks. We had that Peter Week. And Jesus said to us, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, Mario? You're going to stay down? Or are you going to stand? We decided to stand. Because if it is of God, no one will be able to stop it. So I'm asking you, this morning, as I finish right now, did you have a Peter week? You're here watching online. Did you have a Peter week? Maybe you're having a Peter year. You walked on water, but then you sank. You did good on Monday, but messed up on Tuesday. Sabbath is coming, so you try to have a good day on Friday. But this morning, before you came to church, you lost it again. But you came. In your heart, your desire is to stand up. You want to stand up. You're tired of falling down. You want to stand and stay standing. You want to remain standing until Jesus comes. You're begging, you're begging God for help. You want to be consistent and stay consistent. What are you going through? Peters. What is it that is keeping you down? Because it's time to trust in my Jesus. It's time, you individually. See, you, it, it, the church is made of individuals. Each and every single one of us is a member, right? We're a piece of the body. If one of you is not here, the body suffers. If one of the body parts is not moving, the other ones are just struggling what's keeping you from standing because if you're not standing <laughs> it's time to stand it's time to stand you want to stand who here wants to stand I want to say Jesus once and for all I want to stand I want to stand for my Christ yes I have denied him Yes, I have a loud mouth and I, I, I'm sorry, Lord, for talking too much. But I want to stand. So listen to what happened. Your pastor was attacked personally nine years ago. And they say, well, you know, he's no pastor. He's just an evangelist. You know, who is he?
And I had that moment. Lord, I should have never made the decision to come to your church. Listen to how the devil is. I should have never gotten baptized. Jesus says, none of the people that are saying anything about you can take you to heaven. Why don't you do something every Sabbath you come to church, Mario? I don't know if you notice that, but every time I fall here, I look up. I'm imagining Christ. Looking down at me from the cross with a bloody face but his eyes locked on me saying, I did this for you. Not anybody else. So regardless of what people do and say about you, when you come to church, you come to see me first. So get up and stand. And he did the same for every single one of us. He died. So that when you have your Peter moment, you can stand. Father in heaven, we're standing. Because we had a Peter moment. Maybe not this week, maybe before this week, maybe today. We had a Peter moment. And Lord, we fail. But right now, Lord, we can rejoice. We can rejoice. Because even though Satan wanted us down, you came and picked us up. And your Holy Spirit brought us here. And now, Lord, we can walk out of this place, stand up with our head high, knowing that regardless of what we go through, Lord, everything is possible with my Jesus. So, Father, let us not just stand now but just like Peter and the 11, let us continue to stand. Regardless of what comes, let us continue to stand. You know what is going on in every single household represented here. So I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, that you go and visit each home represented here and online. Visit right now visit right now because there's someone going on going through a Peter moment right now so visit touch them, hug them embrace them and thank you because you never leave us or forsake us thank you for your Holy Spirit in Jesus name I pray amen and amen. You may be seated.